whose acts weren't done for public notice, but were done as quiet acts of service. Tonight, we remember such a man, a man whose life was defined by service to a state, a country, and a Boy State program he deeply loved, and a man whose life left an indelible mark on thousands of young men who passed through this program. That man's name is Tom Johnson. Tom was born a little over 78 years ago. He grew up in Rockford, Illinois, where he graduated from Rockford East High School and then Rockford College. From there, he went to Harvard Law School. But when he finished his time at Harvard, he didn't go join a big city law firm like most of his classmates. Instead, in 1968, he joined the Army, where he received a meritorious service medal. And when he was discharged, he again didn't accept the advances from big city law firms. Instead, he went home to Rockford. And he joined the two men who had been his mentors and started the law firm. That law firm remains the biggest law firm in Rockford to this day. With Tom having served as its president for 15 years and having remained there for 40. Rockford and Illinois were Tom's home. He never wanted it any other way. In an age where many people look to move on to a better place, what Tom chose to do was to stay and to make his place better. He was the essence of a gentleman and a scholar, often sought after to speak because of his eloquence and wit, and often sought after to lead because of his judgment and his patience. But to say that Rockford and Illinois were Tom's only homes isn't right, because Tom also spent a year of his life in another state, and that state was the Illinois Premier Boy State. And I truly mean he spent over a year of his life so he was a member of the staff here for 50 years, including serving as the president of the Boy State Corporation for 25. When Tom took the train to the state fairgrounds in Springfield that first time, he probably had little idea of what lie ahead. He couldn't have known about the impact the Premier Boy State would make on him, or the indelible mark he would leave on Premier Boy State. The two were a perfect match. For over 50 years, he shared his love of this country and his dedication to service with thousands of young men like you who passed through this program. His eloquent words stirred many of them to achieve new heights. Those who heard Tom speak seldom forget him. He was also one of the foremost Lincoln scholars in the world. He was director of the Abraham Lincoln Association, and he was a regent chancellor of the Lincoln Academy in the world. For over 30 years, he filled a vast array of leadership roles within the legal profession local, state, and national. I'd list them all, as well as his many, many other professional and civic accolades. Tom would walk. In fact, knowing Tom, he wouldn't want it, but wanted us to do anything like talk about him tonight. He was an eminently humble and private man, and perhaps there was no greater evidence of that than at the end of Boy State in June, where he'd simply deliver his closing remarks flawlessly, and then walk off the stage get in his car and drive home. He didn't wait around to Bask in adoration, he never sought a pat on the back. He simply did his job and did it well, because that was the right thing to do. Tom passed away unexpectedly four months ago. And there's an enormous void in the hearts of everyone who knew him, whether in Rockford or in Boy State. Yet the magnitude of his impact in those two communities is bigger than that void will ever be. I was blessed to share both of those communities with Tom. And I consider it a great honor that he was my mentor, my friend. We will all miss him dearly, but if he were here, he would tell us to just quit all the fuss and get back to work. And that's what we'll do. But before we do that, I thought there was one special way that I could share a bit of time with all of you. You see, for many years, Tom delivered this in morning service, and there will never be another like it. Many of the staff members have heard his words before, but there is really no better way to share with me the essence of who Tom was than to share his words with you. My eloquence will not match his, and my emotions may well get the best of me, but I'd like to share a few of those words with you now. Let us now praise famous men, our fathers who began us. They were honored in their generation and were a glory in their days.
but some there be who have no memorial, or have perished as though they had not been forgiven. But these were men of mercy, whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten, and their name lived to all generations. Those words are aged and obscure. They were written during the time of a soldier named Alexander the Great. Many believe they are sacred, and they explain why we are here tonight. As one generation remembers those who have gone before them. We remember those who answered a call to service, who put themselves in harm's way, particularly those who gave what Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion. It is for us, the living, to be dedicated to the unfinished work, he said. Here in the nation's heartland, proud sons and daughters of the land of Lincoln remember Lincoln's words of Gettysburg even today. More than 150 years and eight wars later, as one generation gathers to pay tribute to another. Let us now praise and dismiss. On Veterans Day, at the stroke of midnight, a solemn vigil begins on the National Mall. As a grateful nation salutes all veterans, all those who wore the uniform of our nation. It is the site of three veterans memorials, the World War II Memorial, the Korean War Veterans Memorial, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. <coughs> I'll never forget the eerie feeling I experienced the first time I saw the memorial to the veterans of the Korean War, what some call the Forgotten War. It was on a foggy Sunday morning. The National Mall is a big place, two and a half miles long, over 300 acres, and I wasn't quite sure where the memorial was. I thought I may not even see it, the fog was so dense. And then out of the fog, a soldier appeared, and then another, and then all of them, one after another. A squad of soldiers emerged from the fog. Statues, of course, stainless steel, each nearly eight feet tall, 19 of them in total, in full battle gear, steel helmets, ponchos, most of them carrying M1 rifles. And carved into a granite wall behind them were four words Freedom is not free. At Gettysburg, Lincoln called it a new birth of freedom. The most recent of the three veterans' memorials to be constructed on the National Mall salutes the veterans of World War II. Some people call that the last good war. The veterans of that war are now in their late 90s, with many dying every day. They were the greatest generation, Tom Woodall called them. They were the generation that stormed the beaches and freed the captives and delivered us all from evil. They were a generation that defined the future of our country and our world. And when the war ended, Americans welcomed them home with parades and cheering crowds. Let us now praise famous men. They were honored in their generation and were glory in their days. During World War II, families hung blue stars in their windows to reflect a family member serving in uniform. And when a loved one was killed, that star was changed to gold. There are 4,000 gold stars, each star representing 100 fallen heroes that make up part of the World War II war. It honors the 400,000 Americans who gave their lives in that war. And along the base of this field of stars appears the words, here we mark the price of freedom, a new birth of freedom, we would say. At the other end of the mall is another memorial to another one, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. 58,261 names sandblasted onto a black granite wall. The comparisons between World War II and the war in Vietnam are difficult to ignore. Our last good war and our most unpopular war. Unlike the returning soldiers of World War II, Vietnam veterans were not welcome to parades and cheering crowds. Americans turned their backs on them instead. They abandoned the property. Some there be who have no more, as though they had not been born. We must never let that happen again. Let that be the greatest lesson in Vietnam. And we as a country have not forgotten that lesson. We praise the men and women who have answered their nation's call for service in Iraq and Afghanistan, including men who are with us here tonight. Many Americans were critical of our continued presence there as well. But if we learned anything from Vietnam, it's that disagree with our nation's leaders, not the brave Americans who put themselves in harm's way. 
even in unpopular ways. The American people have not forgotten the lessons of Vietnam. And the memorial site in America, which now attracts the most visitors, is indeed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. 58,261 names on a black granite bar, 2,957. Many who visit that memorial believe that the cause for which those servicemen died is few, even wrong, but no one goes there to look. It is a holy place. The visitors walk silently reading the names, sometimes reaching out to touch a name of someone they know, sometimes propping up mementos at the base of the wall, not to honor that or any war, nor do we do that here today, but rather to remember the frightened young men who accepted the call of their neighbors and their nation to serve, to protect, and sometimes to die. In 1982, when that wall was erected, a young man approached the workmen who were pouring the concrete foundation to the monument. He was holding a purple heart, he said it belonged to his brother. His brother had died in Vietnam. Would anyone mind, he quietly asked, if he placed it into the concrete? No one minded. For a few minutes, the work stopped. He reverently put the metal into the wet concrete, and as it sank, he saluted. And then he said, now the memorial has a heart. 58,261 names on a black granite wall in the shack of the Lincoln Memorial. Men of mercy, whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten, and their names live to all generations. Never forget. We must never, ever forget. So today, as I read those words to you, his words, I know that Tom is looking down at this boy state encampment, perhaps with a glass of gin in his hand, and a smile, because he loved this place as much as it loved him. In the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln said, the world will little know, nor long remember what we say here. That statement we know is wrong. But he quickly added, but it can never forget what they did here. And that statement could not have been more correct. I think it's very safe to say that Premier Boyce State will never forget what Tom Johnson did here. His imprint on this program will last forever. So on behalf of the entire staff and 50 years of Boyce State citizens, I say, Tom, we love you. We miss you. We love all. We thank you. Please stand. And as Tom would so eloquently put it, with voices proud and strong, please join us in singing the verses, the first and third verses of the Battle of the Republic. My eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Oh. 